You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. I'm Maggie Elliott, the Executive Director of Iowa City Hospice, and we as a community have come together, a number of community organizations, to present um, this caregiver education series. Um, we recognize the immense value of caregivers in the very unique situations that you're in. And um, as today, we have Abby Miller from the Alzheimer's Association who's going to talk about com conversations about dementia. Um, so we we know there's many topics to cover, and this month we're going to cover some conversation topics. Um, next month we're going to be talking about caregiving from a distance. So the third, thir the third Tuesday of every month will go to the end of this year, 1030 to noon at Hills Bank. We have a number of sponsors. We want to thank Hills Bank for being a sponsor, City Channel 4, and the Alzheimer's Association, to name a few. Um, this is being recorded by City Channel 4, and if you have a question, please raise your hand so I can get the microphone to you so that the audience um, can hear the question. So with that, I will turn it over to Abby. Today's program, we're gonna go over the basics of Alzheimer's and some of the conversations that we have with Alzheimer's disease. So one of the things that Dr. Ron Peterson talks about in his video, um, that the general public of um, of our everyday life has about an 8 to 10% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease in their lifetime. Um, as baby boomers age, a huge number of people are entering the period of increased risk for Alzheimer's disease around that age of 65. Some of those people will develop the disease and impact, and the impact of those numbers will bankrupt our current um, medical care system. So everyone wants to know is this an age-related change that I'm having, or is this a sign of Alzheimer's disease? Um, so some typical age-related changes involve making a bad decision once in a while, missing a monthly payment, forgetting which day it is, and losing things from time to time. So at the Alzheimer's Association, we like to, we like to focus on um, our 10 warning signs. Um, in this in this slide here, um, these are what we like to focus on. So uh, memories that or memory changes that disrupt our daily life, and this is a big one. There are things that happen every now and then, maybe once a month, but when we really start to see changes that are affecting our everyday life and that that prohibit us to live our normal daily lives, so that's when we like to to go see a doctor. So this could be something, forgetting something recently learned, a name, a date, some information, what time is dinner, um, asking the same information over and over again, and relying on memory aids or family members to get through your day. And these are also in your blue um, brochures that I handed out called the basics of Alzheimer's. Our second warning sign is challenges in planning or solving problems. So this could be um, problems developing or following a plan, um, problems working with numbers, difficulty keeping track of bills, challenged concentrating, and taking longer than before to do common tasks. Um, our third warning sign is going to be difficulty completing familiar tasks. So those two kind of um, go hand in hand together. So this could be um, getting to work kind of forget the way to get to work or the way to get home. Um, if grandma has a favorite recipe that she makes or chocolate chip cookies or award winning at the fair every year and all of a sudden she can't remember how many cups of chocolate chips to put in her cookies or how much flour or even how long to put them in the oven. Something that she was able to draw so quickly in her previous days and all of a sudden it's becoming a little bit harder for her to do. Our Fourth one is going to be confusion with time or place, and this is just losing track of dates, seasons, or passage of time, um, maybe forgetting where you're at, going on a walk and coming to a T in the road, and not remembering if um, left or right is your way home. The fifth warning sign is trouble with visual images and spatial relationships, and this is going to come into hand when we're driving. Um, 
So difficulty um, judging distances, being able to um, determine um, what, a, what a red light means, what a green light means, um, really concentrating on your what's going on in front of you and what's happening in your rear view mirror and what's happening on, on your side mirror and paying attention to all of it and really understanding what's going on. Our sixth warning sign is going to be new problems with words in speaking or writing. So problems following or joining a conversation, difficulty tracking a conversation, stopping in the middle of a conversation and not remembering exactly what you were talking about, um, not being able to continue your conversation, repeating something that you've already said, um, and calling things the wrong way, the wrong name. So maybe calling your wristwatch a wall clock just simple things like that. The seventh warning sign is misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace steps. Um, so I have many people come up to me and say, I lose my car keys every day. And my response back is, so do I. But I have the ability to retrace my steps. So I know that when I get home from work that I go to the kitchen and maybe grab a snack and let the dog out and go change out of my work clothes, and then when I need to go to the grocery store, I can't find my keys. But I know that I came home and I did, I went to the refrigerator, and then I went and put the dog on a leash, and then I went to my room. So I know where to look, and I find them in the refrigerator, or I find them in my coat pocket. Crazy places to look, but I know that I can take a step back um, and find them. Many place, people will find keys in the refrigerator, in the fruit bowl, um, in the bread pantry, wallets are found in, in different places, um, but they just can't retrace their steps and look, think back to where was the last place I had it, where might it be. The eighth warning sign is decreased or poor judgment. Um, this could be changes in decision making, um, poor judgment with money. This is something we often hear about, um, writing big checks for telemarketers, um, maybe charities that you've never donated to, um, just really not being smart with your money, and it's, and it's something that is not usual for this person. The ninth warning sign is withdrawal from work or social activities. So this one kind of goes back to new problems um, with words and speaking or writing because you might get lost in a conversation or because you might... Um, not be able to track a friend's conversation. Oftentimes we see withdrawal from social activities. So when my grandfather had Alzheimer's disease, he used to go to the corner coffee shop with his male friends and they'd have coffee every morning and talk about what was happening with the grandkids and what was going on in their lives. And he stopped, just all of a sudden stopped going. And the reason being because he couldn't track what they were saying. He didn't understand what Jim was talking about and he didn't understand what Bob was saying. So that's oftentimes just easier for the person instead of going there and not understand what's going on, we'll just see withdrawal. And the 10th warning sign is changes in mood and personality. Um, and this is a really hard one that, that people deal with. Um, and it's because of what Alzheimer's does to our brain. So someone who was the nicest person, gentle, would never use a swear word, all of a sudden is, is saying rude things, is a little, um, a little bit um, more agitated, a little bit more angry. And this is just simply, it's the disease working with our brain. And it's really hard to see for family members and loved ones because we know it isn't, this isn't what's normal for this person, but that's what is kind of so ugly about this disease. And it doesn't happen to everyone. Um, some people are very angry all through life and a little gruff and tough, and all of a sudden with Alzheimer's disease, they're a little bit nicer. Um, but again, it's just the disease working in the brain. Another thing we often hear is, I have dementia, I don't have Alzheimer's. Um, so what is the difference between the two? Dementia is what we like to call an umbrella term. So kind of like the word food. We have vegetables and we have fruits and then there's types of veggies and there's types of fruits and there's types of everything. So dementia is our umbrella term. Alzheimer's disease happens to be the most common type of form of dementia. It um, accounts for 70% of all dementia cases. 
Some other types of dementia are reversible dementias, which could simply be a mixture of medication, a urinary tract infection, a bladder infection, things like that that might cause some dementia-like symptoms. Um, we often see vascular dementia, um, which results from a reduced blood flow to parts of the brain. Mixed dementia, um, which is usually a vascular dementia and, a, and another dementia mixed together. Um, Lewy body disease um, often starts with a wide variation in attention and alertness. Um, they also ex might experience visual hallucinations as well as muscle rigidity, so um, a little bit of Parkinson's in there. And lastly, frontal temporal dementia, um, which is a condition in which the front and side areas of the brain are especially affected. So dementia is a loss of cognitive functioning serious enough to interfere with daily functioning. And it, again, causes changes in memory, language, thought, navigation, behavior, personality, and mood, and planning and organizing. And again, 70% of people with dementia have Alzheimer's, and the other um, most common type is vascular dementia at 17%. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of form of dementia again. Um, more than five million Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's. Many of them are actually not diagnosed um, or will never be diagnosed, but we just know over five million, which is a lot. Um, it is currently the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, but in here in Iowa, it is the fifth leading cause just because we are an aging state, um, but it does hit home a little bit for us. Um, currently, every 68 seconds, someone is um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, it is the only disease in the top 10 that has no cure, um, no prevention, and no way to treat it. And unfortunately, it is a progressive disease um, that is eventually fatal. So the way our brain works is it is connected with cells and neurons and it creates this big network which all of our synapses shoot and our messages are relayed to each other. Um, and Alzheimer's disease essentially destroys our neurons creating what I like to think of of spider webs in our brain that don't allow our messages to transfer. So what's easy for us to think of when our stomach growls and we're hungry when, a, when our stomach growls for someone with Alzheimer's disease, it doesn't shoot across that that's what that means, is that we're hungry, things like that. So the functions that are affected with Alzheimer's disease, um, in the frontal lobe, we often see judgment and movement affected. In our occipital lobe, we see visual processing is affected, and in our prior parietal lobe, movement, orientation, recognition, and perception of stimuli is affected. I had the opportunity last week to um, work at a health fair, and luckily the table next to me um, was a table full of um, human brains, which was very interesting. Um, but for me, working with the Alzheimer's Association, they actually had um, a brain there of someone with Alzheimer's who had early onset. Um, and, and you can see pictures, I've seen many pictures, but until you see a brain, it really doesn't set in. This here is an example um, of a healthy brain on the one side and a um, brain of someone with Alzheimer's on the other side. Um, essentially our brain shrinks and it dies. Um, there aren't supposed to be those gaps in the side where the arrows are pointing. Um, but this is just the way for us to understand that, I mean, the brain, the Alzheimer's brain was probably a f a three fourths of the size of the healthy brain. It's just, it really does sh shrink and shrivel. Um, and that's how we're really affected. So everyone wants to know, what are the risk factors? Am I going to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's? Who do I know is going to get this disease? So our number one risk factor is age. 
Um, it is the greatest risk factor. Every one in nine people over the age of 65 will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And when we reach 85, it's every one in three. Um, so as we get older, our chances increase. Um, women, we are um, more at risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, one of the main reasons is simply because we live longer. Um, our new 2014 facts and figures are actually being released tomorrow. Um, and our main focus of these facts and figures are women in, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we'll, we will be having a new movement um, announced tomorrow that we are working on and a lot more information will be released about that. So it's just something exciting that's going on in the research. So stay tuned for those. Um, family history is also another risk factor. And this is something that's really, I think it's hard to understand because having someone in your family does increase your risk of, of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Yet, not having a family history of Alzheimer's disease does not clear you out from being diagnosed. Just because grandma, grandpa, and mom and dad weren't diagnosed, it doesn't mean that I am free from being diagnosed. I still have the same chance as anyone else next to me of being diagnosed. <clears throat> We're also seeing a lot of research on head injuries. We're hearing about football players, NFL players being diagnosed with, um, with some t um, type of dementia, memory loss, um, and they're really, they're really researching and finding out that these concussions and being hit in the head are really affecting, you know, players like Brett Favre, we're hearing he's having memory loss problems, he can't remember a whole year of his daughter's life. So it's just something scary that we don't think about how our younger lives really affect um, our older lives. So one of the things that we offer at the Alzheimer's Association is a listing of doctors in, in, um, in your area. Um, many people want to go to an, a doctor that specializes in Alzheimer's and unfortunately there aren't any doctors that specialize directly in Alzheimer's. We have neurologists and we have family doctors um, but there isn't a physician out there that only deals with Alzheimer's patients. So these are one of the conversations that we have a lot with our individuals that work with us at the Alzheimer's Association is just um, picking a physician. Um, I like to recommend go to your physician that you feel most comfortable with. So if that is your gynecologist, if that's your podiatrist, if it's your heart doctor, if it's your family care physician, Whatever doctor that you feel the most comfortable with going to is who you should start with. And from there, they will funnel you on to where you belong. Um, but simply um, starting and going to them and just sitting down and talking to them about maybe what you're seeing. Some of the things that we like to suggest is keeping a log. So maybe writing down you and your family have a, have a notebook that you keep um, where you write down things that you notice. Um, so if that's, um, mom forgot to write, walk the dog this morning, or mom forgot to take her medication, or dad got lost in the way to work, um, things like that, so that when we go to the doctor that we can, that we can really tell them what we're seeing. Um, also bring in uh, current and previous health problems also, and also a list of medications. When we talked a little bit earlier about reversible dementias, oftentimes we see um, different drugs being mixed just because of health problems that we have. And sometimes those different prescriptions and herbal remedies and vitamins cause some dementia-like symptoms and those can easily be fixed. Um, so that's why we like to suggest bringing medications. So when we go to our doctor, we're going to have about seven tests done. Um, and this is just to start from beginning to end so that we can rule out all possibilities. So the very first um, assessment that will be done will be a medical history assessment. Um, which is just simply your normal physical, looking at prescription and non-prescription medication, family health history, um, just general information like that. 
The next will be a mental status evaluation, um, just to assess um, sense of time and place, your ability to remember, understand and communicate, ability to do simple math problems. So this might be simply drawing a clock and writing a specific time. Um, remember asking you to remember a set of three words, asking you what day, what month, what season is it. Simple things um, that we should be able to recall, but sometimes with Alzheimer's or dementia, we're not able to. The third one will be a series of evaluations that test memory, reasoning, reasoning um, visual and motor coordination and language skills. Um, the fourth will be a physical examination, which includes blood pressure, nutrition, and pulse, um, testing your nervous system, um, a brain scan to rule out a stroke, and lab tests to rule out other disorders. So each step of this assessment is just to rule out something um, so that when we get to the seventh step, if nothing else has shown up, then that's usually when they'll go to a dementia like or Alzheimer's. Um, a psychiatric evaluation will rule out the emotional causes of symptoms and then simply interviews with family to get more information about the changes will be the last thing that happens. <clears throat> so when the diagnosis is Alzheimer's disease, um, emotions are going to run high. For some of um, the family, this will be a relief. We finally know what's going on. This answers all of our questions. Um, but we also feel a sense of loss. Um, a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's um, is a hard thing to, to grasp and to be told. Um, for the person with the disease, um, they might be in denial. The family might be in denial. They might be angry because it's just not fair. Um, worry, confusion, guilt, shock, fear. We're, it, you're going to go through all of it um, at one time or another. And hopefully at some point, we're able to come to um, the feeling of acceptance, but that will take a different amount of time for everyone in the disease. So with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, um, we recommend to ask a couple questions of the doctor. So we want to know um, why is there a diagnosis of Alzheimer's? Ask him to walk you through the steps. What exactly did you see that that makes you think that this is the correct diagnosis? Um, where you or the person you care for may be in the course of the disease, and on the next slide we'll talk, or this one we will talk about the stages of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then simply what to expect in the future, what are the next steps going forward. So at the Alzheimer's Association, we like to focus on the three stages of Alzheimer's. Oftentimes you'll hear about the seven stages, but we like to focus on the three. Um, so early stage, um, we usually see recent memory loss, difficulty managing money, driving, or handling social situations. Um, and this, many times when we, the people that we work with at the Alzheimer's Association, unfortunately, we see them in the middle stage. We're not seeing a lot of early diagnosis or early detection, um, but early stages is, is where we can, we can help a little bit more. Middle stage, we're going to see difficulty with language, problems keeping track of personal items, and you may need um, a little bit more help with grooming. And in late stage Alzheimer's um, disease, we're going to see long and short term memory affected, um, and also needing more care around the clock. One thing that we stress at the Alzheimer's Association is planning early. Um, I'm a big believer of um, you can't plan early enough. My parents think I'm very annoying because I talk to them about long-term care insurance and I talk about their wills and what's going to happen if something happens because I don't want to come to the, a point in my life where I have to make major life decisions for my parents. I would like them to have some say in it. Um, so being an active partner in your long-term care plan or in your loved one's long-term care plan, um, developing a relationship with your health care team. So if that's your, um, if they're in a nursing home, being a part of that care team, their um, physician, um, if you have home health care, just really forming a team if that's your lawyer, if that's your neighbor, if that's a best friend that's a nurse, 
forming a team so that you always have someone um, to call and ask questions. Hopefully the Alzheimer's Association is also a part of that team and we can help you set one up as well. Um, getting legal and financial issues in order. The last thing that you want to have to deal with um, in late stage Alzheimer's is getting your ducks in a row. So the earlier that we can get that figured out, the better it is and the less that a caregiver and family has to worry about in the later stages. Again, growing your support system is a great thing and just educating yourself about the disease. And the Alzheimer's Association has loads of information. We have websites, we have more education programs like this, we have brochures at our office, books, movies, anything that you want, we are able to provide to you. So a few of the medications that are out there right now um, that you might hear about are Aricept, um, Exelon, Razidine, and Nemenda. Um, oftentimes we'll see a mixture of these, one or the other used, um, but the best way that these um, drugs are seen to help is in the early stage, and that's why we really advocate for early detection is because they're seen to work better on people in the early stage. The hard thing about Alzheimer's disease is when you see one person with Alzheimer's disease, you see one person with Alzheimer's disease. Um, we each have a different brain, or each wired differently. I'm different than my sister. Even though we look exactly alike, we're polar opposites, and that's how our brains are, are um, created, too. So unfortunately, what works for one person with Alzheimer's unfortunately doesn't work for the other. And what might work for six years with one person might work for six days with another. <clears throat> right now there are a lot of um, clinical studies being done all over the U.S. Um, to find a cure, to find a medication, to find something that is going to stop this disease. We were just at our um, national conference in February in New Orleans um, where a new study was brought to um, us um, where they're looking for participants. We do something called Trial Match, and it is a program that the Alzheimer's Association has developed um, where anyone can go onto the website or mail in a card um, to create a profile for you. Um, they will then call you or help you set up your profile online, and mine says, Abby, age 25, white female, no health problems, lives in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, etc. I unfortunately don't fit any of the criteria that we're looking for, but if they ever needed someone my age with my conditions, I would be right in there. Um, oftentimes they're just looking for people to come in and watch a video, to listen to some sounds, to smell a few things, to get a CT scan done. Um, there's a new trial out right now called the A4 trial. Um, they're looking for about 500 people across the U.S. We are very lucky enough to have the University of Iowa participating in this trial. Um, I am waiting for more information on it. Um, the nice thing is for this one, if you don't fit the criteria for the A4 trial, they're also looking for people um, that can just simply be a part of the rest of this study and just participate in other parts so everyone can be involved in that. Um, they did a, a similar study like this for cancer, and, and cancer research, research has, um, as we all know, they have found cures and they have found ways to treat it. So we're really hoping and crossing our fingers that this will turn out the same way for the Alzheimer's, for Alzheimer's disease. Um, clinical trials take anywhere from five to 13 years. Um, but a lot of times it's because we don't have funding and because we don't have research participants. So if you're interested in getting involved, please contact us or stop um, and get a card from me afterwards. So at the Alzheimer's Association, um, some of the different things that we offer, educational programs like this, we have a 24-hour helpline in 365, 24-7. Um, it's a really great tool. So if you are a caregiver and you are um, experiencing something at 11 p.m. that you just need to call and talk to someone or you're going to have a breakdown or you just need a question answered, our 24-7 helpline um, is there for you. Um, if you're someone with the disease and you just want to talk to someone about that you had a bad day and you just <coughs> want to tell someone how frustrating this disease is, there is someone to talk to. There is always someone available. 
Um, and, and it's it makes me feel good that that there's no one should ever go without being being answered or being talked to. We also offer information and referrals. So if you're needing a, um, brochures or if you need home health care agencies, if you need a nursing home listing, if you need um, a neurologist in the Iowa City area, we have all that information at the Alzheimer's Association and we're able to either email, mail it to you, um, give it to you over the phone, whichever way works best for you. We also provide care consultations. We have many people that call and say, we need to get mom into a nursing home, but she just doesn't want to go. And we'll say, why don't we um, get together, have you guys come to the office, and we'll just sit down and we'll talk. And we'll just see how she's feeling, what are her fears, what are her worries, you know, what's really the problem here. Um, we have the same issue with driving and medication and all of the big problems, and we just simply offer um, an opportunity for us to come and talk to you um, and help you through the, the situation. Uh, my favorite part of our what we offer the support groups, and um, we offer caregiver support groups um, in almost all of our counties. Um, this is for family members, loved ones, caregivers, um, daughters, sons, nieces, nephews, grandkids, mothers, fathers. If you want to be in a group and talk about this disease, it's there for you. Um, we have listings on our websites. Um, the other thing that I really like is we have an early stage support group. And I say early stage, um, but it's anywhere from early stage to middle stage just wanting to be involved. So this is where our caregivers and the person with the, the disease can come into a support group. We start off all together and then we branch out. And that way the people with Alzheimer's disease or dementia are able to be around people that are going through the same everyday struggles and frustrations with the disease. Um, and same with our caregivers. They're able to be around caregivers who have loved ones, wives, husbands, um, daughters, and sons that have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and they just need a fellow caregiver, family member to talk with about it. Um, our online community is also amazing. Many people aren't able to get to support groups because it doesn't happen on their lunch hour. Or they have a meeting that day. We have message boards. We have um, phone support groups. We have chat rooms. We have anything that you might need is on our online community. Um, all of our brochures, all of our programs, everything that you can get in paper at our office, you can get online also. Um, and last but not least, our safety services are another thing that we offer. The last thing someone with Alzheimer's or a loved one should have to worry about is wandering and losing a loved one due to wandering. Um, so something that we offer is, um, it's called Medic Alert and Safe Return, and it is simply a bracelet or a necklace um, that you are registered to you and your loved one, um, that you are able to track them if they ever wander or leave the house. Um, so that's something that we can set up for you and, and get ordered for you. Some of the different things that we offer at the Alzheimer's Associ Association is to be an advocate. We're always looking for advocates to contact our um, Congress and our government to make Alzheimer's, um, you know, to get funding, to get funding for research, to get funding for our caregivers. Um, each year we travel to Washington, D.C. Um, to talk to our, to our top officials about, about getting this to be a, national, a nationally recognized disease that we need to find a cure because it's, it's not going away. One of our um, signature events is the Walk to End Alzheimer's that we host um, in Iowa City, in Lower City Park. I believe I'm not positive. It's in September. I want to say the 22nd or the 28th. It's on a Sunday. Um, but this is where we, we raise a bulk of our money for our research and our care and our funding in the area. Um, and it's just great. It's a great opportunity for people with the disease, if they're able to come out, for families and caregivers to either remember someone that's passed away or just to support a loved one and family that's going through the disease. Um, it's always knock on wood. It's been a beautiful day in Iowa City the past couple years. Um, it's, it's just it's a really 
great day to see everyone come together. And it just keeps getting um, bigger and bigger because we're having more and more people affected by the disease. <clears throat> so again, this is our 1-800 number. On the back of all, your, all of your brochures, the 1-800 number is also um, listed on there as well as our website. Um, and again, 24-7, 365, it's always there for you. Are there any questions or any other topics you guys want me to go over? Where does Pick's disease fit into the categories? That's a good question. You often see um, Pick's disease more with the frontal and temporal, and I'm not sure if it's listed in the basics. Um, I know we do have information about more about Pick's disease at the association at the office, and I can absolutely get more information and talk to you more about that. I'm not as educated on Pick's disease as some of the other ones. And then what, what about the um, maybe um, my aunt has had a stroke. So, you know, I don't know that she has dementia, but some of the things are the same. And I was just curious what you had to say about that. Yep. Um, so with strokes, we often see some vascular dementia. Um, and that's just simply because blood has been cut off to portions of the brain. Um, so the symptoms are very similar to Alzheimer's, um, but we see the memory decline more in steps as Alzheimer's is um, kind of a slow, steady decline. So you will see a lot of the same things as Alzheimer's. It might just be more of a prolonged, they might be in one stage or one thing might happen for a while and then it's gonna decline to another step. Um, but yeah, strokes, we, we often see the vascular dementia go hand in hand with that. So then is that progressive? The dementia? Yeah, from vascular. Yes, yep. Um, like I said, it doesn't, it might not happen as quickly as Alzheimer's, it might go on for with Alzheimer's disease, anyone can live for about 2 to 22. There's no specific timeline with Alzheimer's. For one person, it, they might live a year with it. Another person may live 22. Strokes, we, I mean, we see strokes all the time, um, but it might not affect a part of the brain that really affects the memory. Um, but if it, it does, if we do see the vascular dementia, we're going to see it in more steps and not as as a fast, steady decline, if that kind of makes sense. Um, I was just wondering when someone has dementia and how much awareness do they have? I know you talked about um, isolating themselves, um, but how much awareness do they have that things are going on and aren't the same? Um, I can't speak from, I don't want to speak from firsthand experience, um, but I think people with Alzheimer's, they notice it probably before anyone else does. Um, I think they're pretty good at, at maybe hiding the signs or um, maybe if a loved one. I know when my grandfather had it, my grandma kind of hid it from all of us and helped him when he forgot. and. Um, and covered it up for everyone. Um, but sometimes they're very aware of, for example, if they're, they're lost, they, they, I mean, they know they're, what's going on. But um, other times, um, if anyone's ever read the book Still Alice, um, it's a very good, um, I think, story of Alzheimer's disease and really helps you understand what's going on. There's a perfect example in that book where she's at a holiday party and um, <coughs> comes up and talks to a lady, goes and gets a glass of wine and comes back and asks her what her name is. Um, so, she, you know, there's times that they might be more aware of what's going on, but other times it's a brand new conversation, it's a brand new person that they've never met and they're not aware that they just asked, they just didn't talk to you for 15 minutes and um, now they don't know who you are. So I think it, you know, kind of comes and goes. 
you know when the right time is to bring in outside help or tell them that they can't be living on their own or you know and what do you, how do you go about finding a place for them yep. that's a that's a hard question to answer because the right time for one person isn't the right time for the other and it goes hand in hand I think it has to be the right time for the person with the disease but it has to be the right time for the caregiver because um, the person with the disease unfortunately we know will pass eventually um, but the guilt that the caregiver has to live with sometimes if they've done something too quickly or they don't feel right about the situation sometimes can wear on them more than anything else um, and that's what we really like to to tell people is don't do something because you feel pressured as a caregiver because someone told you that you need to have your wife in a nursing home. But it's not the right time for you. Um, we have individuals that maybe will just try respite care just to see how it feels. So maybe um, you have family members that live in... Minnesota, and you just want to try respite care, a weekend stay for your loved one. Um, so you put them in a nursing home for um, the weekend. You go away and you come back and they're either very agitated because they didn't like it or you might come back and they're very content and they liked it. Um, we do recommend just trying it out, having someone come stay with them just to see how you as a caregiver feel but also them as an individual if they're okay with it. Um, but then we will help, um, at the Alzheimer's Association, we'll help you find a nursing home. Um, but we recommend people, just like you go um, and look at different houses, what feels like home to you, you have to go and look at a few of the facilities just to feel what do you feel comfortable with putting your loved one in um, and what feels, what feels good for you as a caregiver and family member. Did I answer your question? Okay. Another um, thing that I would have covered with my conversations about dementia is driving. That's another thing that we, um, that, that caregivers and family members have a hard time. When is the right time to stop driving? How do we get keys away? Um, how do we prevent accidents? Um, so one thing that we recommend is having a doctor's order, um, writing a prescription down that it's time to stop driving. Um, we have family members that take um, cars and keys over to another family member's house or they sell the car or they, they find another way to get it out of sight, kind of out of mind. If they don't see their car, if they don't see their keys sitting there, hopefully they won't think about driving. Um, you as a caregiver might have to hide the keys from them. You might have to park your car at the neighbor's house. Um, but safety comes first, and it's a hard thing because you're taking away their independence. But it's, I think it's better to have one person off the road than to, than to have to deal with anything if anything happens or they get lost while driving. It's just it's not a good feeling for caregivers to have. They have to worry about that all the time. You talked once about bringing the list of medications and everything with, and that sometimes they find out, you know, that things aren't um, reacting well together. But why, it seems like we should be catching that earlier when prescribing, though I know some things are over the counter. Yeah, yep. And that's just simply, you know, being more aware of when you get uh, medications from the pharmacist saying, you know, is it okay? I'm currently on X, Y, Z. Is this medication going to affect it? Um, you know, as we know, doctors are busier than ever, and we don't get much time with them. So they might not remember that you're on blood pressure medication and um, diabetes medication, and they might prescribe something else, and the two don't mix. But there's another form of that drug, you know, a... Uh, um, a non-name brand or something like that. Sometimes it's just the brand of the medications. They don't mix well, but there's another form that will mix better. Um, but I think 
just asking. It's it's never going to harm you to ask when you go pick up your medication from the pharmacist, but sometimes it's just an oversight, unfortunately, but it is something that we see that happens. <coughs> My dad uh, did have Alzheimer's the last three or four years of his life. And he was living in an apartment by himself after mom had passed away. And we had to be real careful about the car situation, get it out of sight. But then he was putting things in places where normally you don't put them there. And so all in all, it he was put in a nursing home with the dementia uh, patients and taken care of there but anytime I visit him it would last about five to ten minutes you show him pictures he made comments about he recognized what was in the picture but it just lasts five ten minutes and then he was up walking down the hall his health was fine his walking his appetite it's all up in head in the head well, what's making this part of your brain shrink and what's k killing those cells? That's what, that's what all of our research and those drug trials, and that's what they can't figure out because in one person, you see the decline of memory and you see our, you know, everyday walking and talking and eating go decline. But in the next person, they can talk until their, you know, one of their last days. So that's what's so hard to, f how they can't find the cure and they can't find the reasoning. They, they're having such a hard time finding what's going on is because it's so different in every person. And it's just, it's, it's frustrating because that's, you just, it's hard to understand how this is even happening. I mean, I am still, you know, I've been, working at the Alzheimer's Association only for two years, but it's frustrating because you want to be able to give people answers and you want to tell them how to stop this disease, but it's not happening and they can't figure it out. Because that's it, they, their health is fine and blood pressure is perfectly normal. They're healthy people, they're happy people. It's, it's all healthy this from the neck down, but... Ugly yeah, disease, yes, yeah. yeah. comes and goes they will rem they will remember things in the past better than the present my friend uh, who's in, in the nursing home now uh, he played piano professionally and if you get him to we go there and sing at least once a week uh, with him because it's just like it wipes out 10 years and he's young again and he's doing the thing that he really loves and even though when you walk him back to the room he won't even remember your name yep long-term memory it's amazing you can bring um photo albums from when the individual was 20 30 15 and they can sit and tell you stories all day long but they couldn't tell you what they had for lunch um music therapy is something that we're seeing um, do wonders with Alzheimer's, people with Alzheimer's disease, individuals who haven't spoken in weeks, as their favorite song will play and they'll sing. And they haven't spoken forever. It's just, it's a really cool thing to see. Um, and it's something that it's really neat that they've found that that little niche that will work with Alzheimer's patients. Another thing with pictures and remembering, um, a few nursing homes, they'll have pictures of the individuals on their room so that they know which room is theirs. Um, but they might not recognize themselves at age 72. They might think of themselves as this young 24-year-old blonde lady. So they'll call the, the kids and say, do you have a picture of a mom when she was 24, maybe tan and blonde and they'll send it over and that's the picture that they put up in her room because that's what she remembers herself as. So um, sometimes you have to step back and you have to enter their world. If they think it's 2008 and they are living in Florida and it is, you know, whatever is going on in their world, it's easier to enter their world and just go along with it 
then to try and explain to them what's going on or or correct them or tell them it's wrong because it, they just don't understand. They are in their present day, and it's just it's better as a caregiver and a loved one to just enter that day with them. It's easier. Uh, my question was, um, I know you talked about all the different emotions. Now, do people get second opinions once they have finally been given a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or like frontal temporal dementia? You know, you've got all of these things and then all of a sudden you get to the relief. Somebody has finally said something is wrong. Do you accept that right away or should you get a second opinion from a neurologist if a neurologist already gave you the first opinion, do you go to another one and just make sure that what they're saying is right, or do you accept it? Yeah, oftentimes, so the reason they do the seven steps of the assessment is to rule out depression, bladder infection, medication. They, they really try to rule out so that it's kind of a last step the only thing else this could be is Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. Um, if you or a family member just is like, no, it's not possible, this is, they're missing something. If you feel in your heart of hearts that that's not the right diagnosis, then I say by all means, get a second opinion. Um, but that is a little bit with the denial. Um, but I think, I don't think it ever hurts to get a second opinion. Um, you know, two diagnoses will, but you still might have denial after that. And you know, it just takes, it takes everyone a different amount of time to accept what's going on. But, you know, no, I don't think it's a bad thing to get two, two opinions. A hand for Abby, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're watching City Channel 4 on TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device. 